Hello and welcome to the Business of Property podcast. I'm Stuart. I'm Simon. And I'm the expat property guy. And we're all property people running our own businesses. And this podcast is just us chatting, as we often do, about anything and everything property. As you will have already guessed, we have a third party with us today, named only as the expat property guy. And we'll we'll dig into a bit of that. But just to give a bit of background to the expat property guy, this is a person that moved to Hong Kong back in 2006, still lives there today, has purchased in Hong Kong. And I'm going to let uh, him speak about that because it's quite an interesting story. But the reason we've invited the expat property guy on today is because we thought it'd be an interesting perspective to get a to hear about someone's property experiences in another country and also their experiences of trying to invest in another country or back into this country. So expat property guy, would you like just to give us a quick introduction of yourself, please? Yeah, so basically my story can be heard on my own podcast, which you can find at www.expatpropertystory.com. And the short version is that I met my wife in 2001. We got married in 2005 a couple of years before that we bought a property in london so that would be 2003 and then as you say we moved to hong kong in 2006 and because expats usually earn a little bit more money as expats than they do in their own countries we managed to save quite well in the first couple of years and we'd amassed uh, a small pot of gold by about 2009 which was just after the financial crisis so we did we didn't really know what to do with this pot of gold so i went looking for an independent financial advisor and we found one and he advised us to put this this lump sum into a kind of a pension plan and also to have a you know like a a monthly contribution as well so for a couple of years that grew really well just because you know when we started it the markets were at the bottom. So we accumulated quite a lot of money. And in the meantime, our London property, I was keeping an eye on right move and Zoopla and checking on the price. And that was doing really well. And the, the property that we were actually living in as a rental property in Hong Kong, we'd noticed how much that had gone up in value. And we started thinking, you know, well, you know, maybe we should try and get some property. So we went back to the the financial advisor and he was like, no, no, this is much too risky. You don't want to do that. And uh, so we thought, okay, all right, we'll listen to him. And then we kept seeing prices going up and up. So we went back a year later and he said, no, no. And he filled us with horror stories. And then we started to get a bit more clued up and worked out that really we we worked out his motivation was not the same as ours. So we eventually decided to buy a property in Hong Kong. So we bought a very, very small one bedroom property in the new territories, which is kind of like the suburbs of Hong Kong. So that was about 400,000 pounds. And it was an off plan new build apartment. And we, by the time it was built, it was worth 600,000. So it had gone up by 200,000 pounds in you know, in the in the space at the time, it was we we bought it or while it was being built, and then we decided right, I think we need to get more property, so we decided to ditch our financial advisor, and that's the point when my podcast begins. From that point, that's fantastic. And just in that short introduction, I've already got so many extra questions for you. <laughs> Excellent, fire um, away. So, I think sort of picking up sort of towards the end of that to start with. You you purchased this apartment or, or flat. I'm not quite sure how it should be referred to for, for that kind of property in, in Hong Kong. So that was in a, a much bigger block, presumably. How does that kind of purchase work in Hong Kong? Are, are there leaseholds or share of freeholds? Or, and how do service charges and things like that fit in and, and block management and all, all those sorts of things around that, that element? Well, I guess it's a freehold. I mean, sorry, I guess it's a leasehold not really sure about that but yeah you're right there are huge service charges because they have i mean that particular place that we bought there was you know the the amount of staff because because in hong kong all developments usually have like a clubhouse so you've got like a swimming pool outdoor swimming pool indoor swimming pool all these facilities and kind of almost like concierge type service so that comes at a premium so you you do you do have to pay quite a lot on that 
But that's why those kind of that mentality exists in Hong Kong. So those developments do tend to hold their value, whereas new build apartments and flats in, in the UK don't, because as if you listen to Vicky Wushe on my podcast she talks about the deterioration of a culture of a building so a new build can start off very well in England but then within a few years one bad tenant one bad landlord can spoil the whole block that doesn't really happen in Hong Kong. How how big a block is it that it's in? Our one was relatively small by Hong Kong's standards I think it was only about maybe 15 16 stories. I thought you were going to say 15 or 16 flats but 15 or 16 stories yeah how many flats were there per story? (laughs) I think it was about six on each floor i think wow okay that's that's lots so so yeah i suppose when you when you split service charges or multiply should i say service charges across all of those you can afford to run a swimming pool and and other other bits and pieces yeah and there's there's about 12 blocks <laughs> oh wow okay in the development yes yeah, so it's not just one single block oh wow so they, they all share those facilities yes Okay. Yeah. So you, you said already that the you, you purchased it for for four hundred thousand. Was, was that four hundred thousand pounds? Yeah. I mean, r- roughly. If if you yeah, if you do yeah. a, a rough ten dollars, ten Hong Kong dollars to one pound. Okay. And now now as we speak now, it's about ten point two eight at the moment. Is the interbank rate? Okay. So purchase about four hundred thousand, worth about six hundred thousand by the time you're able to to move into it. Actually, I should, should no. I'll come back to that. So it's so worth 600000 by the time it was completed. Can you give us an idea of how much those service charges were? Uh, maybe, maybe about £150 a month, I think. Yeah, about £150 a month. Okay, that, that doesn't strike me as that much. I, I know flats here in the UK that, that have service charges higher than that and no swimming pools. <laughs> yeah, true, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess I was saying it's expensive because maybe the particular development that we bought on the service charges were a little higher than some of the other ones. And I might have underestimated that. I'm terrible at remembering figures, <laughs> which is not very clever for someone doing property, right? Yeah, I'm just thinking we, we have a, a flat in uh, Croydon, which is which, which was the uh, it's a six month flip that we've owned for over two and a bit years now. But <laughs> the service charges on that are at over £300 a month. So Again, relatively speaking, it sounds it's sounds, and, and there's certainly no swimming pool in Croydon. Uh, right. You get a working front door. That's what you get. Okay. <laughs> so that that must have been quite an experience for you guys as you were drawing to completion on that property. That the property was valued at fifty fifty percent greater. And would you say that was at the point where you suddenly realised, hey, there's something in this property thing? Yeah, it was that, and also keeping an eye on the on the the value of our London property, which by that time had tripled in value you know and whereabouts in london was the london property east london Leighton. so you moved in at a, when the property was valued at 50 percent. so where you're talking about it now we didn't move in it wasn't for us we bought it as 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 an investment okay right yeah, it's, it's too too small for us to live in <laughs> right okay i say okay so that makes sense now yeah we rent we actually rent so we have like a village house here which is very cheap very quite a, a lot bigger than that property, but still very small. And yeah, but we've got cheap rent compared to most people in Hong Kong. So, do you still own the that property that, that you're referring to? Uh, well, I guess I can tell you that no, we don't, because I haven't revealed that on my podcast yet, which is a slow reveal of our story. But yet, no, we we sold it. Okay. And unfortunately, I'll give you a little teaser: we didn't get six hundred thousand. <laughs> Right. And the intonation is telling me it's lower than 600,000. Yeah, well, what happened was we couldn't sell it for, you can't sell it. If you sell it for, within the first three years that you own it, you have to pay something like 15% stamp duty. So we were desperately clinging on, you know, and, and the price was sort of going down and down. And this was around about the time of, well, there was, there was a, lot of, a lot going on between Trump and China at the time. And it was really affecting both both the currency exchange rate and it was also affecting property prices in Hong Kong. And then protests arrived, 2019. So, you know, it's like, what's that expression, trying to catch a falling knife? So, I mean, we, we could have sold it for about 5.5, 5, 
550,000, but we were kind of waiting for it to go up to six, you know, and we ended up selling it at five. So we still, we still made a hundred thousand pounds in what, three years. So. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's the power of property, isn't it? Is that we can, we can feel downhearted that you, that you, you know, you, you only made 25% return in three years, which by anyone else's measure is pretty good. And something that you were telling us just before we hit the, the record button was about potential failed purchases. Can you tell us a little bit more about those? Were they within, again, within Hong Kong or elsewhere? Right. So what happened was we decided we wanted to to cash in. We, we, we cashed in about half of the pension plan to put down as a deposit for the Hong Kong property, which left half in. And then we took out another quarter, if you like. So there was about £200,000 in the pension plan. We took out £100,000 for the prop, for the Hong Kong property. And then there was, there was about 50000 that we couldn't touch until it matured in 25 years. So we took out what we could, which was about 50000 and we and we remortgaged our London property. So we took the equity out of that or a lot, a lot we took about 55% of the equity out of that there was about 50,000 pounds left on the mortgage so we got about 180,000 190,000 to play with added to the the 60,000 so we had about two, a pot of about 250,000 and we decided we were going to you know buy more property in the UK with that so I've found a sourcing agent you know did a lot of research looked at uh, followed podcasts read books followed the forums and decided to buy a property in the center of Manchester. And we thought we bought it, went back on holiday, back to the UK for summer. Six weeks later, I got a phone call from the sourcing agent. Oh, sorry, there's been a typo and the flat's been sold twice. So, okay, these things happen. Never mind. Okay, you know, just be philosophical about it, move on. A typo on what? Uh, well, I, I don't really know, but I do remember. I mean, I, I didn't know, think about it too much at the time, but there was something from the solicitor. I didn't really check it out properly, but it, there was a, there was something on it that, in retrospect, I looked back and went, "Oh yeah, that was funny." Something there. So I think they'd they'd basically, I don't know, on an Excel sheet, put the same net, put, you know, sold it twice, and then when it when it got to the solicitor stage, and they were kind of going through it they were like well there's probably there's, there's a name here and there's a name there so what's going on and then they worked it out and so you'd you'd in, you'd encountered solicitors fees at that stage yeah we got them all back okay that's good yeah we got everything back and then went again and then unbelievably lightning struck twice exactly the same thing happened with the same <laughs> sourcing agent yes well yeah were you at all suspicious at this point <laughs> angry livid uh yeah sort of got very angry you know let him have it how, how much time had elapsed or had you lost basically through this process of two failed attempts well we decided to to start our expat property story if you like our uk expat property story in easter 2017 so the first failed purchase was in july of 2017 uh we found out in about august late august and then there was another property i think the other property the one in leeds on the outskirts of leeds was probably about october and then that was like a, it was a new build development that one was a house but it was a new build development and they got they got us another house on the same estate and then and this is where we're at up to in my story on my podcast then because I'd, I'd lined up all the mortgage, got all the ducks in a row and everything. And then it turned out that after I'd had a right go at the agent, I had to go back to him and said, uh, actually, my lender won't lend to me anymore. <laughs> because in that intervening, in intervening period, uh, the lender, Vida, Vida Home Loans, had changed their criteria so that they would no longer lend less than £100,000 to people living outside the EU. Actually, that, that brings up a, a great sort of topic of questions around the process of this. So you mentioned coming back on holiday to the UK, but the bulk of this time you were doing all this remotely from Hong Kong. Yeah. So uh, you were buying new builds for in both occasions, is that correct? Correct. 
yeah so you um you were buying presumably off plan so so nobody could actually go around and look at them anyway but you hadn't even been around and looked at show homes or anything like that you were relying on your your sourcing agent in the uk is that, that correct yes madness right <laughs> i don't know i don't know. Pe- people do it very successfully sometimes Apparently not, not on this occasion, but... <laughs> not with this particular agent. Yeah, th- this is one of the reasons I've started my podcast is to show people that there is an alternative to buying new build properties, you know, new build off-plan properties in the UK, because it is very common among expats. So with this sourcing agent, how did it actually work? You said you did some research, presumably, to find the, the sourcing agent, but then how did how did they present a property to you? What did you have to choose from? And then how did that progress? Well, they would send a property and they would kind of put a little bit of the, they put a little bit of pressure, not as much pressure as Hong Kong. I mean, I could talk about that as well. The The sales process in Hong Kong is really something else. You know, it's, it's lucky draw and stuff like this. And, 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 they, and they have a lucky draw day, like a raffle day. And everyone who's registered an interest in the property turns up on this one day, not, not even one day, they do it in a series of days. So they release the flats at different they release different flats in the development at different stages. And depending on how the market is, they price it accordingly. So the price can change over the course of the development. And then they get everyone there. There's a raffle to get to the, to the final of the raffle. And then when you get to the final, you're in this room and it's in like a big conference center. And they use these false walls to bring it in to make the room really tight and then, and it's like it's like bingo, and it's all very loud, and the Chinese love microphones, so it's all like really. And then people are rushing out of the room to pick that because basically, when you get your when your ticket comes up, you get first dibs of which property you want to choose, right? So it's all this kind of frantic scene, and it's it's well worth seeing. It's much better to go to it if you're not actually buying and just watch. A bit like going to an auction. I'd love to go to an auction. I haven't done that, but. Yeah, auctions are fun. But when you talked about the false walls, I also because of you can you can you can imagine exactly what they're trying to do, and obviously they're doing a great job of it. But I actually imagine the walls coming in whilst they're doing it, moving slowly, so that you feel like you've got to make a decision before you get squashed by the walls. Yeah, and then also when you're choosing your your property, there's the queue of people behind you, and it's like, come on, hurry up, look. Oh, look. And you can imagine some people going, "I'll oh, just buy it, just buy it." Yeah. Yeah, just deal with it, even though it's a you know, multi-thousand-pound purchase. Yeah. Do you get to look at the properties in advance? Do they have brochures or anything like that? They, they have a show flat in an industrial unit somewhere, nowhere near the development. You know, you, you could be anywhere. So that you get to see sort of how it might look or how one example it does might look, look. It does look exactly – it does end up looking exactly like it does in the, you know – but, but there's there's things you don't re- you can't really get a get a feel for you know we were quite close to a motorway. What what floor did you purchase on actually? Well, you know we we couldn't really afford too much we because you know the prices decreased the lower you get so we were actually on the very first floor, <laughs> smallest flat on the first floor. It still sounds like you know people listening will probably think, wow these guys have got money four hundred thousand pounds for a property, but you know we we we're, we're very small potato. So you, you went through this process to buy that that flat in, in Hong Kong, yeah? Mm. So we got distracted a bit from the UK ones, but we'll, we'll stay with Hong Kong for the moment. This is good. Did you have to go through this multiple times before you were successful? Or Yes. Oh, wow. How, how, many, how many times did you go through the raffles and the, <laughs> the uh, races it, and things? It depends how hot the market is, because that was a hot market and a hot development. We failed. We didn't, we didn't get that one. And actually, the, 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 them, the second time we did that, that it wasn't so hot. There wasn't the whole lucky draw thing. So we were able to just, but it was still kind of quite pressured, but it wasn't, it wasn't like a lucky draw situation because the market wasn't quite as hot at that stage when, we, when it was a few, it was about five months later when something else came up. That's, I, I still, I'm just amazed that properties are sold that way and people just go in and sort of buy the first thing they can they can put a pin on kind of but, thing but you know you know this kind of explains why all those new build properties in the uk get sold the way they do because the culture of investors over here is to buy like that so a lot of hong kong investors a lot of chinese investors buy properties like that so so all those new build developments in the uk are sold first to expats and to Chinese investors because they're used to that culture of buying off plan but it doesn't work as well in the UK it's a bit more 
they're a bit of a rip off to be fair okay so that's that's a good good segue back to the uk then <laughs> so your experience with with that you were you were buying remotely the sourcing agent you'd chosen was sending you some properties that may or may not have been interesting to you what sort of things did you look for when you were trying to choose what to go with or, or was it just Yes, quick, I'll go with the first thing, <laughs> following your, your raffle experiences. <laughs> I, I, I spoke to someone here in Hong Kong who had used this sourcing agent and was happy with them. So I'd done a little bit of due diligence on that. I mean, my own process of buying property in the UK has been very much based on trusting a person rather than being too fussed about the actual I, I'm kind of like that, really. I like to kind of think I, I well, obviously not, I don't do it very well, but I, I like to think I can judge people. So I, I went with that over spending days and nights on right move and doing due diligence like that. I kind of prefer to do my due diligence and gut instinct on the person and, and the people involved and the numbers on the spreadsheet rather than going, I want to buy in Manchester. I think that makes sense. And I I operate very similarly. I think, you know, forgive the cliche, but I do think, you know, business is relationships and relationships are based on trust and shared understanding. So that makes a lot of sense. And I think the the question I've got for you, (laughs) the bigger one is, did you continue to use the agent, the same agent after the two failed attempts? I think you can answer that one for yourself, Stuart, don't you? (laughs) <laughs> well i'd like to think so but yes um, yeah but yeah i have been pretty naive up until that point maybe so uh no no we ditched him no very good and then uh, just the other question which is more from a strategic level was just around so I understand you, you've looked at hong kong what was and so i think simon sort of alluded to this but in terms of sort of strategies you're sort of thinking around we'd actually want some in the uk and some in hong kong because i guess Thinking about the, the the growth that you saw just in the building of a of a plot that you'd invested in, actually in my mind because I I didn't you know I wasn't aware of it I haven't spent enough time looking at global markets that way but I thought well actually when you're seeing that sort of increase as well I can imagine there's a bit of a dichotomy for you around whether I invest in UK first or or Hong Kong first what was your sort of thought process Well I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what my thought process was then but I can tell you what it is now that. I wouldn't do that now because, I mean, at the time, I didn't really know. I, I know so much more now than I than I did then. But I knew that we had to sell that property before we leave Hong Kong. So our plan is to go back to the UK in about four or five years. So if we still had that property and we'd relocated to the UK, we would have to pay capital gains tax to the UK government on that property, even though it was bought in Hong Kong. Yeah. And even if we rented it out, even if we rented it out, we would also be liable for income tax in the UK. I mean, there is some kind of, I forgot what, what they call it, the, uh, they have kind of like an agreement between, between governments about maybe one gets paid first and then there's an, they have like a tax agreement between two, two countries. So there is something like that. But yeah, it makes no sense to keep a property in Hong Kong when, if, you, if, you're, if you subsequently become tax resident in the UK. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes sense as well, particularly, you know, knowing that you've, you've already got a plan in place to cut, to return. And similarly, just in case there's anyone else listening, we, if we were to sell our London property, I can't remember exactly why this is, but we need to sell that before we go back to the UK to get a more advantageous capital gains tax bill. Something for something that happened in 2015. Anyone who wants to know can go and look that up and work out what I'm talking about. <laughs> but it's, it's to do with the, the, the laws changed around 2015, if it was originally your principal home. Yeah, I can't remember the details of that, but I do remember there was a, a change to the tax law in how the capital gains is treated, as you say, when it was, when it was your home. I, I take it you have been renting out that property in your original property in London all, yes. all this time you've been away from it. Yeah. What, what originally made you choose to do that rather than selling it and and taking the money off to Hong Kong? I think you'll find a lot of people in Hong Kong and, and probably expats everywhere, they think they're only going to be away a couple of years, you know, and 16 years later, still here. <laughs> yes, it's life, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be back in a month. Yeah, uh, and, uh... They, call it, they call it the golden handcuffs. I mean, you know, I'd love to go back to the UK, I'll be honest with you, but, you know, 
my tax is never never higher than 16 percent so yeah and i think the i think the main residence i think it's like if you haven't lived in it for yeah from 2015 for three years then then it's then it's treated as a as a secondary as a secondary home so uh well anonymous property guy <laughs> we, we 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 are very thankful that you've been able to share some time with us today and yeah we look forward to the release of more of your story on your podcast and hopefully once that's been released we'll invite you to return to share a little bit more about some of your property journey because i think it's quite interesting and certainly provides a different perspective from our point so uh, from both simon and myself thank you very much for joining us today that's no, been a pleasure for everyone else you can find any relevant links on the business of com. you can also find us on twitter at biz of property b-i-z of property where we'll be having conversations. Other than that, we'll see you on the next episode.